Good morning, everyone. I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar, AWCs, LCA, EPDs, GWP, and other abbreviations explained. My name is Marcy Weber, and I'll be the education team moderator for today's presentation. Today's presenter is our very own Lauren Ross, Director of Sustainability and Energy. We have a quick disclaimer. Note that this webinar and associated slides should not be used as a substitute for competent engineering support and expertise. Today's presentation is um, approved by AIA. And if you need um, AIA reporting, please email us your AIA number. Today's presentation is copyrighted. The team that's providing this course for you, our speaker, Lauren Ross, Director of Sustainability and Energy, and our Director of Educational Outreach, Lori Cook, Manager of Education and Ed Accreditation, myself, Marcy, and our Education Administrator, Kim Paulson. I'm gonna pass you off to Lauren to discuss the many abbreviations. Okay, thank you. Hopefully you can see my, my screen of the course description now. So this is the course description. Hopefully you guys read it and that's why you're decided to, to come, to come to this webinar. It's basically the sustainability is becoming more and more important, um, whether it's through this uh, presidential administration or, or government officials in general, or just the desire to be. And it's something that at least when I was just a design structural engineer, I wasn't as exposed to. So I'm really hoping that we can kind of discuss what all these things are and kind of the limitations of it so that with what information that I would have wanted to know when I was a designer. So here's the learning objectives. Um, hopefully you got to see those as well when you're signing up for the course. Notice that I'm, we're going to be talking about a lot about AWC and CWC EPDs. So that's American Wood Council, which is what the organization I represent, and also the Canadian Wood Council. And we do joint EPDs because there's so much um, cross, uh, cross between the American and Canadian border for, for wood. So let's, let's start with a definition of life cycle ass assessment, or LCA. It's defined as a methodology for assessing environmental impacts associated with a commercial product, process, or service. Now, what that actually means in a more common language is that LCA is an accounting for the env potential environmental impacts when making a product in today's, in, at least in the context of today's discussion. So here's more example, a detailed example of just that, of just the part of the process that happens in the mill itself. So log logs are unloaded in the, to the log yard, sorted and protected from insects attack. Here fuel is consumed and equipment is in service. Recycled water may be used to protect the logs. The manufacturing process begins with debarking, which requires some electricity to run the machines. Those green logs are then cut to size, which requires some more electricity. Green lumber is sorted into bins through an elaborate system of conveyor belts that are driven by electric motors. Once sorted, the lumber is moved to the kiln for drying. Um, energy to dry the lumber is derived from hog fuel. And hog fuel is the bark, sawdust, planer shavings, and other waste products from the manufacturing process. Finally, now dry, the lumber is playing to the correct size. Now, each step uses energy for which environmental impacts can be measured. For example, the electricity used in each step will be associated with electricity production. Depending on, or depending on the grid where the mill is located, it could be coal, nuclear, hydropower. So the same kilowatt hour won't have the same impacts for mills in the northwest versus the southeast. Fortunately, though, the most energy intensive part of the process is actually the drying of the wood, which is used, which is that biofuel. So that is common to nearly all mills. 
But that's just the mill part of the process, which is defined as the A3 stage. Now, the A stages are the manufacturing and transportation of the products. B is for the use, and C is for the disposal. Most products, LCAs, cover the A1 to A3 stages, which is called cradle to gate, as it covers the very beginning of the product creation to when the product leaves the gate of the facility or mill in our case. Since transporting A4 and construction process A5 and operational use of the building products B stages is so dependent upon the project, manufacturers usually don't include those stages unless it is about a very specific project or they have to make a lot of assumptions. A cradle to grave LCA covers the creation of the, of the production, so A1, through its end of life stages, so C4. But the scope of the LCA isn't limited to just the stages of the uh, stages of the manufacturing or usage process. The scope of the LCA report might be could also be limited or defined by what it covers. For example, it could be an industry wide, like AWC has for all lumber or whatever it is, or it could be just for a single company, or it could even be down to a specific mill. All of the impacts and assumptions made in the life cycle assessment are documented in a report. So for lumber, just these, the, the uh, cradle to gate, the A1 through A stages, A3 stages, that's a 65 page report. And it says all the assumptions and all the calculations and all those things. But when I was a designer, there's no way I had time to read a 65 page report for every single product. So a more simplified report is needed to allow for a quick comparison between products and a readily understood summary of environmental impact measures and energy usage. That is where an EPD comes in. So EPD is that shortened report, and it's nothing more than an excerpt of critical information found in the LCA report. EPDs consist mostly of tables so that users can quickly get the information they are after. EPDs are developed according to ISO standards, which require the creation of a product category rule, or PCR. And we'll talk about PCRs a little bit more in a bit. AWC and Canadian Wood Council's EPDs are developed from the content of a third party, or excuse me, are developed from the content of a third party verified LCA reports. For every industry wide EPD that AWC has, there's a corresponding LCA report. Also, um, EPDs are just an extraction of the con. Even though they're just an extraction of the content of the LCA report, they are also independently certified as well. So you have the LCA report that has to be verified and then the excerpt from the LCA report, which is the EPD, and that has to be certified. So there's a lot of third party um, verification on these. But EBT, EPDs have a limitation. As a rule, EPDs cannot be compared unless the results are from a comparative LCA report or both LCA reports use the same product category rules. Basically, the best description I've heard is that EPDs are like a nutrition label for products, although this is by far a major oversimplification. Um, Comparing Wheaties to a servant of frosting, Frosted Flakes is pretty straightforward. Comparing the environmental impact measures of a ton of steel to a cubic meter of lumber, it's not so simple. For food labels, there are standards for measuring the amount of sugar in a serving. There's a far greater uncertainty when it comes to comparing products from different PCRs. And that's largely usually from different materials. So it's, it, you have a, a much larger challenge when doing that. Just like an LCA report, an EPD can be limited to certain stages of product's life. Also, EPDs could be industry average data, company or product specific, or even mill, mill or facility specific. There's even some discussions about having supply chain batches of EPDs. These would be based upon the exact values of the materials being used or the electricity production during the manufacturing process. So it would, if you're doing it on a mill level, it would be what the mill 
the the combination of, of energy that's being used to create the grid at the time that log was sawed sawn so that uh, you know exactly how much it is. It's not just an average of the grid grid's impacts, it is the exact time of that. And that no one has has said that they they required that yet, but there is discussions for it. Okay. Now let's talk about the current AWC and uh, Canadian Wood Council's EPDs and how they were created. AWC elected to use the UL Environmental as its program operator. Now program operator is a term basically that's just kind of that, set, that sets up the rules for, for the EPD and LCAs. There are numerous program operators in the US and each has program rules um, based on the ISO standards. As you'll see in the case of AWC, ULE plays an active role in establishing and executing the rules for the LCA report, which, as we've discussed, is where the work is done. So the program rules, which ULE operates, were guided by a panel of LCA experts. These ULE program rules were generic in nature and govern how the organization, the program operator, conducts the business of developing the PCR and the process for reviewing LCA reports and then certifying the EPDs. Basically, these rules are the rules for making the rules. <laughs> so it's, it's, a, it's a bit like a making a standard, you could say. It's the rules for doing the, the rules for the thing. The program operator follows the rules to facilitate the creation of the program, or program category, product category rules. Um, this is done by a technical panel, which establishes the rules for conducting the life cycle assessment report and environmental product declaration ISO standards. For life cycle assessment are heavily performance based. And so as a result, LCA practitioners have uh, ample room for professional judgment. In some ways, it it's, can be considered as much an art as it is a science. Um, Product category rules provides a means to ensure that similar assumptions are used in creating the LCA report. They have rules such as how impacts should be allocated. So for example, let's say a process has two products, say lumber uh, and wood chips, and they're both sold. How should the impacts be shared between them? Should it be based upon mass of the products? So if the lumber weighs three times that of that produced by the chips, should the lumber have 75% of the impacts or should it be based upon the economic values? Um, so lumber might be worth more than the chips or maybe even vice versa. So you would have to say, okay, the electricity has so much impact, 75% goes to the lumber, 25 goes to the chips or, or some other value if it's based on economic impact or however, however that allocation rule is. The development of the PCR and the resulting life cycle assessment reports can be an iterative process, like pretty much everything, right? Especially for the first versions of the PCR. The ULE program operator rules uh, for the current AWC EPDs were developed from an existing North American PCR for WIC products. Since AWC issued EPDs in 20, the first EPDs in 2013, the process for updating the PCR in 2018 was primarily alignment for the, to the ISO standards. Since 2019 was the second time through the process, the updates and how they would be managed in the LCA reports were better understood. The point of this slide is to emphasize that behind every EPD, there is an LCA report. The LCA report is developed following product category rules. Product category rules are created by a program operator per the program rules. And then in AWC's case, um, the LCA report and the EPDs are then verified and certified by the program operator, ULE. That isn't necessarily always the case for, for, the, that for all products that the program operator who developed the PCR is the one that does the verification but it is for, for lumber in AWC's EPDs. So here's some more details about the PCR. Unsurprisingly, they must follow appropriate standards. 
And as the name implies, they are very specific to a product, but they can also be very broad. For example, all wood products use the same PCR. So lumber, plywood, and cross-laminated timber all use the same PCR. And to me, this is a problem with PCRs. Since they can be so broad, there's a lot of wiggle room with how they are applied, which limits the resultant e how the resultant EPDs can be fairly compared. The PCRs have a lifespan of five years and must be available to the, pro uh, to the public. So when I want to find the PCR for wood products, I just use Google, and it takes me to the ULE website, um, where there I can see the PCR for free after making a free account with ULE. The PCR also sets limits. These can be requirements for what must be included. For example, wood product EPDs must include the A1 through A stages. They can include more, but they have to include the A1 through A3. But the PCR might also omit information that might be desired. For example, AWC EPDs have little information about fiber sourcing beyond requiring sustainable har harvesting methods. The requirements for, of the PCRs say that the EPDs have specific information. So each EPD has a declared unit. This shows the relationship between the amount of product and the impacts. Most wood products use cubic meters. In fact, most, um, you'll notice that the impacts and things are all, all in metric, which is, I think, kind of interesting too. Most wood products use cubic meter, meters, so each impact or each kilogram or megajoule or whatever it is in the tables are per cubic meter of lumber, plywood or OSB. Um, several impacts are required in the EPDs. I believe that AWC's EPDs have some 20 or so uh, declared, but the big seven are here and they're the ones that are required. Now, a lot of the current focus is on global warming potential sometimes even at the neglect of the others. So say a designer has EPDs for all the products to be used on the project. If they were wanting to have the least environmental impact, they would need to be able to compare those EPDs. So I need to compare whether I should be using uh, OSB or plywood. In order to compare those, I have to have um, certain requirements met per ISO 14025 comparisons are only allowed under specific conditions. First, the EPDs must use the same PCR. This, is auto, this automatically rules out some of the significant comparisons. For example, designers can't just look at EPDs for concrete and lumber and know which material should be used for a structural system. The functional or declared unit needs to be the same, and that makes sense. You don't want to compare a cubic, a cubic foot of lumber to a cubic meter of lumber. Um, the criteria for inclusion of impacts and outputs needs to also be the same. For example, AWC's EPDs include the use of gasoline in the trucks to haul the logs to the mill because this is a significant impact. If another EPD doesn't include that gas, it is no longer a fair comparison. The data quality needs to be consistent. This can mean that the date associated with the data isn't important. For example, say one EPD is a couple of years older than another. The newer EPD will have emissions associated with the newer grid, or at least what the what they have newer reporting data for that grid. So it might show a smaller global warming potential. Both products could be using the same grid, but one appears better just because it has more up to date up to date data. Likewise, sometimes the newer data might, for whatever reason, have make the product appear worse, even though it, it might not be. Finally, EPDs need to have the same calculation rules. And for example, this, uh, this problem could mean like the allocation rules. The current EPDs for lumber use different allocation rules than the previous EPDs. One is based on mass and the other one is based on the economic value. How the lumber is produced hasn't changed and might be maybe even not the grid or whatever it is, that it could be exactly everything the same, but since the allocation has changed, the numbers have changed. 
Because the usefulness of EPDs is so limited, green rating systems and standards usually only require products to have EPDs or are very specific about how they can be compared. LEED, NGBS, and the IGCC all have points for pathways that recognize EPDs. For LEED and NGBS, points are given if enough products have EPDs. So they might say you need 20 different products to have EPDs or whatever it is. For all three standards, EPDs that are product specific versus industry averages are given more weight um, by counting as if they were more than one EPD. So if it's an industry wide, it might count for one. If it's product specific, it might count for two, for example, towards that 20 limit of 20 or requirement of 20. Another growing trend in sustainability is for buy, buy clean policies. Now, these are preferential procurement policies that say government agencies or buyers in general need to purchase material with the least environmental impact, which sounds great. Buy clean legislation has been passed in California and Colorado and has been the subject of agency discussions at the federal level as well as multiple other states such as Washington. Additionally, several codes and standards committees have discussed it. Usually, EPDs are considered as a tool for selecting the product with the lowest G GWP. Now, that's, this is where it becomes a problem because it sounds great, but this approach can be impractical for some building products while it may be great for others. Concrete, for example, has many ingredients that can be adjusted at the batch plant to change the GWP. Conversely, most wood products are manufactured in rural areas then transported to centers using trucks or trains. There are no knobs to turn. In order to lower the GWP of harvested wood products, most, there's no knobs to turn to lower the GWP. Most mass timber manufacturing facilities such as CLT are new because they're, they're new and state of the art. And the electricity grid is the primary variable in changing GWP. And that's not, that's not unique to wood. Like steel has, is very reliant upon the grid as well. While capital improvements to lumber mills may lower the GWP, it can take several years and millions of dollars to implement that. So to make a cogen plant or, or even something as simple as installing, uh, installing the solar panels could take, will take a lot of investment and time. Now, studies have shown that mass timber construction has a lower GWP on a square foot basis than competing materials. So, but that's not really what buy clean agency, buy clean does. As more legislators and, because it's not by a per, per cubic foot basis or Q square foot basis, it's just by the comparing products to other products of the same type. As more legislators and regulatory agencies consider buy clean measures, they must keep in mind that most building products have a unique story to tell and a one size approach does not fit all. All manufacturers are committed to lowering the GWP of their products, but regulations must be carefully crafted so that the goals are achievable. A 20% reduction may be achievable for one material, but would be unnecessary and extremely costly or impractical for another. EPDs are not an ideal tool for all cases either. Legislatures and regulators must understand the consequences of every material as they choose to implement mandatory GWP reductions. Another limitation to buy clean is even given in the name. It focuses on the procurement stage and buying the best products within that industry. It isn't a build clean policy where the entire building is optimized. Designers should be more efficient with how much material is used, or they should question its use altogether and analyze if a different material or industry can provide the same uh, same function with reduced impacts and EPDs don't provide that. That optimization to do that is allowed through a whole building LCA. It's where the entire building designs are compared versus just the individual products to themselves. For example, I know a building that has, that did a whole building LCA done to optimize the reduction of its greenhouse gases. Originally, they were going to use a large amount of insulation to reduce the operational energy. However, 
after the analysis, the designer realized that the energy needed to produce that much insulation was going to be so large that it wouldn't actually reduce the operational energy as much as it would increase the construction GWP in the building. So they still used insulation, obviously, but it just wasn't as much because the GWP of the insulation of that last inch of insulation isn't as much as the GWP to create that. Um, just using buy clean policies, this would never have been known to the designers. Unlike buy clean, whole building LCAs can reduce the impacts of all stages of a building life, not just the material procurement stage. Now there's some difficulties with whole building LCA. Uh, one difficulty of the whole building LCAs is that there isn't a benchmark. The average value of buildings isn't known. So organizations like the Carbon Leadership Forum and SE 2050 are gathering data on buildings to create a database so that there is something to compare against. Um, another difficulty is that whole building LCA increased the cost of design process. Additional work and additional options have to be considered and then analyzed. So of course there's an additional burden that has to be, be done. Um, especially for smaller projects, this can be overkill if you're just redoing a roof or whatever it is. Okay, so now let's discuss AWC's EPDs a little bit more in particular. Now, AWC has several EPDs on its website. In addition to the ones just shown here, we have uh, EPDs of other wood products because AWC is a nice landing page for all those. And so things like fiberboard EPDs are also there. But the ones shown here are the main ones uh, that are produced, uh, that, that represent the production of AWC's members. Now for, for time, for sake of time and clarity, we're gonna focus on that softwood lumber EPD. It, uh, most of the, anything that applies to the lumber can apply to the other products as well. So it's just a matter of going through and, and talking about it. Uh, so AWC was the first primary building material association to publish industry-wide environmental impact declarations. Uh, the first EPDs were certified by ULE in 2013 and used a product category rule from FP Innovations. In 2019, ULE updated the PCR and the second generation of EPDs were certified in 2020. All of AWC's and the Canadian Wood Council's CWC uh, all of their EPDs are cradled to gate, which includes the A1 through A stages. Uh, the PCR also contains an appendix that outlines a methodology for estimating the biogenic carbon remaining in the wood products after 100 years use in uh, the landfill. When I say biogenic carbon, I mean the carbon within the, the log itself uh, that is that you actually touch and feel, not the carbon that is is emitted when like in the process of sawing the log and using that electricity. Uh, so that's biogenic carbon is the one that the actual physical carbon that's in the product. Uh, so this additional information is permitted per the ISO standards. So the EPD reproduces the results developed in the LCA report for softwood lumber. In ISO 21930 and the PCR specify the categories to be reported. The entries are the potential environmental impacts reported for each stage, in this case just the A1, A2, and A3. The measures are representative units that are presented in the US EPA Tracy tool. So for example, uh, eutrophic eutrophication is consistently reported in kilograms of nitrogen equivalent. A table provides interesting insights. This table provides interesting insights to the harvesting, A1, transportation to the mill, A2, and manufacturing stages, A3. Of the 63, 63 kilograms of CO2 equivalent, that's right there, um, approximately 18% of that is due to the harvesting, uh, sorry, excuse me, 18% is, is associated with the transportation from the logs um, to the mill. Lastly, approximately 64% is, 
is, is due to the manufacturing process. So you can see that A4 really dominant or A3 really dominates the numbers. So you can see that it's this illustrates the challenge of finding measurable and meaningful GWP reductions in a process that is already returning low values. It's just the electrical grid that it's dependent upon. The second entry for global warming, the second line right here, um, is, is includes biogenic carbon. The total carbon is the same for either uh, the first or second line. This indicates that all of the embedded or stored carbon that enters the mill as a log is accounted for throughout the manufacturing process. Although it does not leave the process, does not all leave the process as lumber, as we'll talk about in the next few slides. Now, these to me, these this these this table highlights the difficulty with EPDs, as we've been discussing. I mean, are these values high, low? I, what is a designer supposed to know or do with these things? Is is uh, so? We have a sixty-three. I have to be able to compare. Um, to another product in order to know if I should use this one or not. Just 63 just doesn't tell me much. So, and unfortunately, that is often inappropriate to compare. For example, I can't tell you that these, our latest 2020 EPDs say that the industry has gotten cleaner um, because the allocation process is different. So from that mass to, to uh, economic values. So it, the process itself might not have changed. The making of the lumber, the grid, none of that might have changed or it might have gotten cleaner, but that doesn't necessarily reflect in the EPDs because how the EPDs, the rules for calculating the EPDs have changed. Um, and so I can't, I can't do that comparison, and that's even to uh, softwood lumber to softwood lumber. So here's the amount of energy used in the production of softwood lumber. As you can see, the first and third line, most of the energy needed comes from renewable energy. Now that's the waste products being burnt to dry the lumber, that's that hog fuel. The second line shows the energy associated with the log as a material. In other words, if someone were to burn the log, this is the amount of energy that would be released. Now, those impacts are, those are interesting impacts, but the most interesting thing to me about the EPDs has to do with the biogenic carbon. Or the, and in order to really understand that, um, we need to understand the carbon cycle. If we look at a forest, it is a cycle in itself. Trees absorb carbon and grow, eventually die, and release that carbon back into the atmosphere. This could be through a fire or natural decay. But as long as the forest carbon stock is increasing, i.e. the amount of forest is growing, the global warming effect is beneficial. Now what we're interested in is what happens when we interrupt that cycle. How does use of wood products affect global warming? The absorbed carbon is in the tree. So when harvested, a portion of that carbon is held as the log. The rest are held in the roots, branches, and needles, which will decay and leave room for new trees to grow. It's just basically the same natural cycle the forest goes through anyway. It's just the log is harvested instead of naturally decays or is burnt or whatever it is. Um, the log goes into the mill and becomes lumber, which is used in a building. Now this is the first part where the advantages of using wood products is seen. The lumber holds onto the carbon for the life of the building. So instead of the tree decaying in the forest, the carbon is stored. Stored carbon is great because a kilogram of CO2 in the air now is worse than a CO2 of kilo, CO2 kilogram later. It's, a, it's an effect. We have a very limited amount of time to change the direction of global warming, so we need, we need immediate results. Um, so having, having results now is better than having results later. Eventually, the building will be torn down. Now, some of it will be, some of the wood products could be reused, recycled, and that's always great and the best option. 
but currently the majority of, of the stuff will end up in a landfill, at least in the United States. This too can actually be another positive because landfills prevent the full decay of the wood. So some of that original carbon will be sequestered potentially forever. Using wood products and building construction interrupts that forest carbon cycle and then it delays the emissions because it's being used in a building and then when it goes into a landfill, it can actually, it'll actually permanently sequester that carbon. So here are the numbers right out of the table from the EPDs. Um, the first line shows the amount of kilograms of CO2E that is harvested. The second line shows how much biogenic carbon is actually stored in the product. The difference between the totals shown in one line and line one and line two is the amount of waste or co-products, uh, waste burnt to dry the products. The second line shows the values for the A3 and C4 phase. The A3 is the manufacturing process and the 20, uh, 1025 number shows the amount of biogenic carbon stored in co-products or waste. That's this number right here. Now, I need to emphasize that it, it fiber is, is, is used, is precious, right? We wanna use as much fiber as we can. So it could be going, that co-products could be going to paper or, or whatever it is, or plywood or whatever. But in an EPD that's about softwood lumber, it doesn't, it doesn't differentiate going between um, between going is waste or going between paper or plywood or whatever. It just lumps all it to get all of it together because it's not used in the lumber. So while that value seems high, it's because of how much is actually used in the lumber versus all the other wood products that, that can be made from that. So co-products could be chips used for boards, fibers used for paper, and that hog fuel used for biofuel combustion. The 844 number is the uh, kilograms of CO2E that the product stores when leaving the gate of the mill. So that's the amount of carbon of CO2E that is, that is stored in the building. That's the delayed part. So here are the exact same numbers, except for I, I, I rounded them and I did it in a little chart so that it's, it's easier to understand, hopefully. So we take about 2,000 kilograms of CO2 from the air to make that tree, and then that goes into the mill. Of that, about 185 kilograms is used to dry the wood, the energy. And then about 1,000 kilograms is is used as those co-products and waste, right? And that leaves about 845 kilograms of embedded carbon going into the building, okay? And that's, a, that's permanently delayed, uh, or sorry, permanently delayed, that is delayed for the life of the building, right? And then eventually we can say that those, that building is deconstructed and, We'll, if we say that all of it goes to the landfill, which hopefully it won't, we'll hopefully get a lot of recycling and things. But of that amount, that 845, about 135 uh, kilograms of CO2E is going to be released through decomposition. It's not all CO2, but that's the point of the E, the equivalent. So methane has has its own, own equivalency. Um, and then that leaves about 708 kilograms of permanently sequestered carbon. So when you buy a, when you buy a piece of lumber, um, that 85 to 708, I think that's about 84% or so, ends up being permanently sequestered. So here are the numbers without as much rounding this, so you can have them for reference. About half the carbon of the logs goes to co-products and waste. Uh, Nine percent for energy and six point five percent from eventual decomposition of the landfill. The actual amount of permanently sequestered carbon is seven hundred and eight. 
Now that works out to be about 84% of every piece of lumber that is used will be permanently sequestered. Now obviously wood products are great, but what more can the industry do? First, we will pre be preparing and increasing support for buy clean and build clean. We will be working with advocates to make sure that the wood products and the wood and its unique properties are recognized and appropriately included. Uh, part of that will be including our or be improving the quality of your EPDs. In particular, we want to improve the participation rate of the mills and the surveys used to create the EPDs. Our goal is to have all companies be included. So we expect the next round to be to have significant next round of EPDs to have significantly more robust values. And domestically, we hope to codify the benefits of using biogenic carbon materials in building products, take, getting credit for that 708 kilograms of permanently sequestered, or that delaying the, the 800 um, kilograms in the, in the building itself. Now, next month's webinar, we're also gonna discuss two other tools that um, are being developed for users. The first is fiber sourcing tool, because remember, the EPDs don't have much um, no information about fiber sourcing. So there's a tool being developed that increases the transparency of the forest management method. The second is a tool that estimates the emissions association associated with the distribution of wood product from the mills to the job site. So that's that A4 value. And it's gonna, it's, if you remember, I said that since it's very pro project specific, a lot of assumptions are gonna have to be made. And that's, that's what this is gonna be. We're trying to figure out how far from, on average, the distance goes from the mill to the job site. And whether that uses trucks, trains, or ships, or whatever it may be, and figuring out the impact associated with that. So that concludes my presentation, but if you have any questions, please please let me know, ask away. And here's my email address if you prefer to contact me offline um, so we can have a discussion or whatever, whatever feels best for you. So hopefully, hopefully we've, we've gotten some questions. Hi, Lauren, this is Lori, and we have had questions come in. So, um, and, and folks, feel free to, to keep submitting them as we're talking. We'll do our best to answer as many as we can. Uh, so the first question is kind of a, the, the overarching uh, question. You know, the, the, uh, why are we spending, expending so much energy to save energy here? <laughs> Yeah, I, I get that. I get that. That that is a that that is a good question, actually. And I think it's one that designers have to have to always face, right? Um, when I started designing, I had to I had to learn when a project was done. In other words, like how much how much did I need to sharpen the the pencil to get to get more accurate values, or was it good enough and and we could move forward? Or I was going to be wasting my time if I if I did did more accurate calculations and it would just end up with the same results. And that's, I mean, that's something designers always have to face, right? Um, and, th and these EPDs and things, they're, they're hard. They're like, they can cost up to $20,000 to have an EPD produced because of all the steps and things, right? And so it can be expensive, especially for small businesses. It can be hard and that's, Part of the reason why stuff like buy clean is concerning because we don't want to get rid of small small businesses and just only have only have big players be allowed to be making products. Um, but all that being said, in order to tackle climate change, in order to tackle um, sustainability, we have to have some basis, some knowledge for it, and that's what engineering is about is taking known numbers and applying them and predicting and, and using that, right? And that's what we're doing here. And to a large extent, it's just getting going. I heard one comment that, um, I think it was from the Carbon Leadership Forum, that the talking about the embedded carbon in buildings is about 20 years behind talking about energy efficiency. And so while a lot of this 
seems excessive or new, that is because it is just new. It's going to be a lot more common as we as we move forward. Hopefully that hopefully that answered the question in an understandable way. Yeah, no, that was very thorough. All right. Um, couple of questions coming in on EPDs and PCRs and uh, things like that. So the first question on EPDs, uh, is there any accounting of the product cost uh, or, or any sort of um, you know, economic uh, driver of, associated with the EPD in the evaluation? No, not really. I mean, it can, it can, it can, the allocation rules can, can be based on, on cost, but that's like if you're, if you're making multiple products in the same process, which is, you know, pretty dang common, um, how to allocate the, the, the different impacts to them. But it, if you're looking and saying, hey, if I have an EPD, can I know, like, can I figure out how much carbon per dollar I'm spending or something like that? It, it doesn't. And that's that's also another one of those interesting and kind of hard, difficult things with 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 buy clean is because oftentimes governments have have requirements to get the lowest bidder, right? To get to get whatever that is. And now you're adding another requirement on top of it, which might conflict, right? Do I get the lowest, the least expensive stuff or do I get the cleanest stuff? And so uh, there, there's going to have to be some form of of interplay between those two to figure out um, what the ultimate value is. Mm -hmm. All right, here's a here's an excellent question. You were talking about uh, in the PCR how we are we only have one PCR right now. Mm -hmm. So how when will a, a more specifically segregated would product PCR allow for more equitable comparison and, and what is the current uh, PCR? What are the shortcomings of lumping all the wood products together in one PCR? So there's there's several, right? I mean it it whenever you make whenever you make a broad thing like that, it's gonna make it so that there's more more open to interpretation. And the more open to interpretation um, you have the the less it's going it's the less it's going to um, be able to be a accurate, you know, it's going to be more, it's going to include more art than it is science, the more, the more that happens. Um, one example would be that, that, I mean, the current PCRs, they use a declared unit. They use that cubic meter. No one, no one specifies a cubic meter of, of wood. That's not, that's not how you do it. You don't say this building requires so many cubic meters. You say it requires so many studs or so much plywood or whatever it is. So, Ideally, what we would be comparing would be would be the functional unit. The this uh, I need to resist a thousand pounds, and and that and then I could I could compare. Okay, I could use this stud. I could use an LVL. I could use a concrete. I could use a steel. Whatever it is, I could compare the function, and that's that's kind of what the whole building LCA gets to um, is because it's the building has a certain function and we have to be able to do that but the pcrs don't really reflect that as very well and by having them be very generic it only makes that worse so if that makes sense right right absolutely all right uh here's a, another good question about epds so we have these epds uh mm -hmm. Can we use them to qualify for lead points uh, on their own, or do they need to be accompanied by any additional sustainability certification or, or industry certification or other paperwork? Yeah, so one pathway, one pathway in lead to get points is, is with EPDs. But if I, if I recall correctly, they also lead also requires um, for certification, you have to show that um, it's done under a sustainable, uh, sustainable forestry practice. So that can be SFI or FSC or or whatever whatever it, it equivalent could be. But um, you have to have that as well. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, can you? You had some slides uh, 
pre where you were doing some some uh, carbon accounting, I believe. Uh -huh. um, uh, and there was a question on those uh, related to what did uh, keep keep going back. I think it was what does the negative sign imply? Okay. Uh, so yeah, I think it was uh, in, in yeah. this one here. So the negative sign, what that means is, if if you think about it, is how much is being emitted to the atmosphere, right? When in that harvesting, in that tree growing process, it's not emitting carbon into the atmosphere. It's soaking up carbon into the atmosphere, from the atmosphere. So it's a negative. It's taking it out of the atmosphere into uh, the solid form. And so that's what that negative negative is, is that um, it's grabbing from the atmosphere. It's a negative amount from the atmosphere. And if you look at, at let's see, at this guy right here, that's why this biogenic carbon is why this value right here is negative too, is because with the right. biogenic carbon, you can account for it. Now, the current current requirements say that, hey, if I, if I count it, then I also have to count it as an emission at the end. So that's why it, it kind of cancels it out. So I end up, I end up with that 63, whether I include it biogenic carbon or not, even though really we know that this this value has an impact. And that's one of the things that we want to to codify is that more more um, building projects and things can get credit for that. And uh, this is this is probably not one of the questions, but I I've, I've had this asked of me before is that, OK, if we take take into account that the, we're storing carbon in the building, doesn't that mean the more wood I use, the better, the better I, the better I am, the more, the more um, beneficial that building is to the environment, and and in some ways that answer is yes, but that's not really an accurate description, because yes, if I just lump extra wood in, yeah, that's that's more sequestering, right? But you only have so much that can be so much wood that can be got from uh, sustainable management. And so really what you're looking at then is saying, okay, if I lump so much into this building, that might mean that I can't build another building or whatever it may be. So you're limited by how much how much the forest can support because obviously we 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 want sustainable forestry practices. No one, including the wood industry, wants forests to disappear. Otherwise, you know, it it doesn't can't continue to work and go with that. Hmm. Yeah. All right. Um, so we have a lot of structural engineers in our audience, and uh -huh. this is something that uh, I think a lot of a lot of us might be curious about when you know when dealing with our designs, uh, specifying new wood versus specifying reclaimed lumber. Um, mm -hmm. or, or reused lumber. Are there any benefits that we can realize from that? Um, and you know, I'm I'm happy to give some opinions on that from the, the structural <laughs> side and regrading as well. Um, yeah, yeah. I so, a little bit more. Yeah. So I I mean I guess that depends on what the question means. If you're saying like if you're getting to a some benefits of that you're going to get benefits for that in like lead and ngvs and things like that anytime you use recycled material or reused materials that's it's great right because you're giving a second life to a product that's already been that's already been produced you're you're cutting kind of cutting that uh, that amount of emissions in half now from a structural side yeah there there are there are the difficulties right with 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 using recycled reused lumber because you have to try to figure out what species it is if you're wanting to be super accurate again this goes back to that accuracy versus versus uh um time and 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 how much worth right we figure out the species figure out the grade and sometimes that that just doesn't exist right and so you have to go through that regrading process and, and Lori, i'll let you chime in from there i guess yeah the, the, you know the regrading process can certainly um, add a cost premium so you know i think it, it depends on uh, the needs of the project um, for certain projects you know having reclaimed lumber that you want to reuse uh, might make sense for other projects it might not make financial sense but you know the the nds does uh 
call out. I can't remember the exact section, but it does have a requ requirement that if you're using, you know, resawn, remanufactured lumber, it does have to be regraded and have an approved grade stamp on it. So, you know, yeah. just echoing what Lauren said, and and again, you know, um, the the cost for hiring somebody to come out for a few days, uh, you know, it it depends on your project scale. Uh, so, mm -hmm. it may be a small expense, a small line item in a, in a much larger project, but on smaller projects, it might not necessarily be uh, financially uh, reasonable, economically reasonable to to specify reclaimed lumber. Yeah, and, and it, it depends on how far the the grader has to go and things like that. So it I mean there's there's a lot of there's a lot of questions in that. I think that's one of the reasons why when we see recycled lumber, we often see it in a non structural being used for non structural ways, right? Is so mm -hmm. that they they get around that and yet still have plus sometimes old lumber looks really cool. I mean it's it pretty. does, yeah. <laughs> it, it, has that nice weathered look. Yeah, it's, uh, yeah. it, it's almost a shame to hide it, hide it behind some sort of um, wall membrane. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, someone here is asking just some, some comments talking about, you know, we do, we have one PCR and then we're making, uh, I, I know we talked about this a little bit, but making multiple EPDs from it. Um, mm -hmm. Are there, what are some of the, it, Basically, how do we how do we get a meaningful difference um, when we're we're using the same PCR and then you know comparing sometimes very different wood products? You know, an eye joist doesn't necessarily have a whole lot in common with a two by four. Right. Yeah, and that that is that is the challenge, right? As as an engineer, what I would have as a structural engineer, what I would have wanted to have done is is to say, okay, these are my these. This is what I'm using. I'm using 200 studs or whatever it is, and then I have an EPD that says, okay, this this stud is this. Oh, and then I could look and say, oh, this LVL is this, and I can just compare them. Right. That's what I would want is a nice clean system. But unfortunately, we're not there yet, and. Um, it's going to take time to get there, unfortunately, um, and because EPDs weren't really, they weren't really designed for that type of thing. PCRs weren't designed for it. They were much more designed towards the idea of showing whether you're making progress as far as becoming cleaner than they were for comparing specifically like different, real different products, right? And so it's really hard to say. I can I can compare whether I should use a plywood a plywood um, a plywood sheeting material to, for, to resist uh, lateral loads, or I should use you know a, a lumber system, right? And and you know the, just even in and of itself the quantity of what's going to be required because the lumber sheeting is not nearly as strong as that plywood or OSB or whatever. It's going to take a lot of of effort in that and. So it's it's not it's not as clean as and as easy, and I guess that's probably maybe the biggest biggest takeaway I would like to give from this from this um, from this presentation is that just because you have the number doesn't mean that it's it's it's, it's golden like you're good to set you're you're set to go. You can get EPDs from databases or from AWC's website and things like that, but that doesn't mean that that you're you're off the hook for just looking at two numbers and saying you're good because that's not that's not the case that you have to you have to do do more work than that unfortunately at least at the moment all right and then one last question before we close it out um i know we've made some brief references to you know the whole building lca approach mm -hmm. um comparing you know a, a a whole building approach, you know, are there any um, any pointers that you might want to provide with our, our audience on, you know, are we comparing wood versus steel versus concrete or, or what type of um, comparisons are, are folks making, you know, when, when we're looking at a whole building LCA, what, what type of... You know, so it's, it's really up to the designer, right? I mean, that's, that's, that's one of the nice things about 
whole building the LCA is is yeah you should you, I think you should compare you should compare a concrete building to a CLT building because I think you're going to get a significant result difference than that but that's that's of my opinion right that you could do a whole building LCA and just and not swap materials like that um, and just do just do like like I was showing of trying to figure out insulation values right um, that isn't necessarily how what material to use it's 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 how much material to use so you're really flexible on how a whole building LCA works and I'm, I'm really hoping that standards and, and policies can can kind of move in that direction um, and but it, it you're right it's going to need to have something some form of it, the definition of what you need to compare to to say you did a legitimate legitimate whole building LCA right that kind of a performance based comparison yep. rather than just uh, yep. how much right. the, does yep. one metric or one you know one unit yep. weigh or yeah contribute. exactly and 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 fortunately that's that's it's not you're you're wide open that hasn't been set yet mm -hmm. all right thank you Lauren and thank you everyone.